Okay, good evening, everyone. Good evening and welcome. My name is Gerrit Skafsma, and I'll be your host for this evening. I'm a PhD researcher here at the University of Amsterdam. I work on climate change and civil disobedience. I'd like to begin by thanking everyone for joining us this evening. It's fantastic to have such a great turnout, both here and online. I'd also like to thank the University of Amsterdam, the Amsterdam School for Cultural Analysis, and SPAI 25. Let me say that again. Thanks to the University of Amsterdam, the Amsterdam School for Cultural Analysis, uh, and of course, SPAI 25 for making this evening possible. A special word of thanks to Jetske Brouwer and Dr. Elo Kingma from ASCA for supporting this initiative. The program this evening is as follows. I will begin with some brief remarks about the relationship between activism and academia before handing over to our panel. Each of them will give a short presentation with their views on the subject. We'll then move to what will hopefully be the highlight of the evening, the panel discussion. I will get this, the discussion started with a couple of questions, and then we will open up the floor to questions from the audience. Please don't be in a hurry to leave at the end of the session. We will be having drinks afterwards, and the conversation can continue in a more relaxed and informal setting. Let me begin by introducing our panel this evening. Um, Harriet Bergman is a PhD researcher at the University of Antwerp, working on political emotions, climate justice, and activism. She wrote the foreword to the Dutch translation of Andreas Malm's How to Blow Up a Pipeline and contributes to the publications Hart, Hoofd, and Jacobin. She's also a member of the Stroom for Snellers group. Marta Wens is an assistant professor at the Water and Climate Risk Group at the Institute for Environmental Studies at the Freie, Uni Freie Universiteit here in Amsterdam. In her research, she investigates water security and societal impacts, with a specific focus on modeling the intertwined nature of drought risk and human adaptation. She works with research institutes in the Global South on climate resilience and is a member of Scientist Rebellion. Anna Kervers is a PhD student at the University of Amsterdam, researching the link between money creation and climate change. She's been participating in civil disobedience with Extinction Rebellion since 2019. Also with us this evening is Christelle van Eck. She works as an assistant professor at the Amsterdam School for Communication Research here at the University of Amsterdam. Her research focuses on climate change and communication. For example, what are effective communication strategies for academics who want to engage with the public on climate issues? Next to her research activity, she's passionate about communicating her work beyond academia. And then finally, we have Thomas Wells with us. He's a philosopher at Leiden University. His research and teaching focuses on applied ethics and political philosophy, especially issues relating to global justice and political economy. He's written several pieces on the relationship between academia and activism. Thank you all very much for making yourselves available this evening. OK, let's begin by introducing the topic. I want to reflect, reflect briefly on the relationship between academia and society. Academics, as scholars and educators, have a unique position in society. They possess expert knowledge and skills that can be used to contribute to social and political issues. During the COVID pandemic, scientists appeared on our television screens and in the news on a, nightly, on a daily basis, guiding us through the unprecedented crisis. When it comes to the climate crisis, scientists have also played an important role in bringing our attention to the challenges we face. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has, over more than three decades, brought together thousands of scientists to better understand the causes and probable consequences of increasing gas, greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere. However, over the last 10 years, many scientists have turned to various forms of <coughs> climate activism out of a frustration that the situation is not changing quickly enough. In the United States, James Hansen, who previously worked at NASA, and Peter Kalmus, who currently works there, are some of the more famous examples of scientists engaging in climate activism, alongside or in combination with their academic pursuits. Both have been arrested for their climate activism. Another interesting example of a scholar activist is Rose Abramoff, a soil scientist working at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. She lost her job after disrupting the annual meeting of the American Geophysical Union, together with Peter Kalmus. They jumped onto the stage and unfurled a banner that said, out of the lab and into the streets. She was fired by her employer for engaging what they said was personal activity, engaging in what they said was personal activity on a work trip. 
Now, climate scientists like Kalmus, Hansen, and Abramov have received significant media attention and helped to bring attention to the climate crisis. However, the climate crisis is but one of many issues that academics have engaged in activism in, in order to bring about change. For example, Carl Sagan, the Cornell University astronomer and science communicator, was arrested in 1986, together with Bernard Lohn from the Harvard School of Public Health for protesting against the use of, or protesting against nuclear weapons testing in the United States. An example of a less confrontational, but perhaps more effective uh, activist academic is Marian Baird, at the University of Sydney. Her research on the impacts and costs of paid parental leave, together with campaigning that she did as part of the National Foundation for Australian Women and the coalition building that she did at the University of Sydney with the Women and Work Research Group, contributed significantly to the introduction of national paid parental leave in Australia. In the United States, Angela Davis has worked as a philosopher and social theorist while also being deeply involved in campaigns for racial justice and prison abolition. Her activism is in part inspired by the Frankfurt School philosopher Herbert Marcuse, who, she says, taught her that it was possible to be an academic, an activist, a scholar, and a revolutionary all at the same time. However, academics who combine their scholarly interests with activism face several challenges. One is that as academics, the public has the expectation that they will provide objective and unbiased information about their subject of expertise. By engaging in activism, act academics may be perceived as acting in a partisan way, potentially damaging their credibility. This concern is often found in the comments section of articles about academics engaging in climate activism, especially activism that relates to the climate crisis. Engaging in activism also takes up a lot of time and energy, which may detract from research and teaching, which are the main responsibilities of academics. Engaging in activism may also negatively affect the reputation of the academic or the institution where they work, especially if their activism focuses on particularly controversial issues. Now, the purpose of this evening's panel discussion is to get different perspectives on the issue of activism and academia, with a particular focus on climate activism. We will now begin with short presentations from each of our panelists. Harriet, over to you. That's you and this is me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I wanted to uh, use my six, seven minutes for two points. One, uh, to talk a bit about uh, credibility, damaged reputation, uh, those kinds of subjects. And then my next slide is about um, academic freedom and neutrality and objectivity, and if there is such a thing, because I think those two things should be leading in this kind of discussion. Um, and what you see on my fantastic slide uh, is some of the moments uh, Shell had the honor to visit the UFA and to, uh, well, damage our uh, precious reputation with their tentacles, because I think there is, um, when we talk about objectivity or reputation or uh, damaged credibility, it is often the thing that threatens what we are used to that is seen as damaging, right? So the ones who protest, who call out a problem, are considered to be the problem, rather than that which is actually the problem is the problem. So this is the classic uh, Sara Ahmed reference, the feminist killjoy, who says, by exposing a problem, you become a problem. And often, uh, if, for example, Marianne van Loon, who is uh, working at Shell and who is, I would say, clearly a problem, and I say this as a personal uh, speaker and not on behalf of the University of Antwerp, because they might get in trouble if I say so, but of course, uh, people are already taking steps to make sure that people who work at Shell and other damaging companies will be uh, held personally accountable for their uh, crimes, uh, which uh, I, th I think you could say they are doing. <laughs> and if such a speaker shows up at a career event, uh, at uh, any kind of event at a university, we provide them credibility we give them uh, a better reputation than what they actually deserve, and thereby also, I would say, diminish the reputation of the institution that they're speaking. If you invite someone who denies uh, what is going on, 
either explicitly by saying this does not happen or implicitly by saying we spend a lot of money on green energy, haha, uh, pay five cents more when you tank, we will plant a tree. This, of course, is also a form of climate denial and a form of greenwashing. If you invite these kinds of people to your events, then you are contributing to legitimating uh, what they are doing, which is wrong. Students and scientists and academics and other people who confront these kinds of speakers, both at events, but also confront the idea that Shell has a place in a university through funding, for example, which is not as uh, big of a problem at the UVA, but except, for example, in Wageningen or some of the technical universities, this is a big problem. They often even have their own space on campus. <laughs> Uh, they collaborate, uh, they, uh, yeah, they really clean their image, which uh, I, I find really interesting. A lot of people who apply for a job at Shell apply for the very limited available places in green energy and in the transition, whereas they do not have that many spaces, of course, because the biggest part of the Shell budget goes to continuing business as usual, which in the end will, well, you get the gist, right? So... Here we see some of the more recent, uh, well, things where people uh, affiliated with the University of Amsterdam try to keep Shell out. So one is a moment where Marianne van Loon was invited for room for discussion, as if we can, and I mean, we can have a discussion, right? You can have a discussion with everyone. We are now having a discussion with each other. That's good. On the other hand, I would like it if we put someone like Marianne van Loon on stage that we have not first year or sixth year economic students opposite of them, but for example, Roger Cox or someone who has similar weight to put in the debate, not to diminish any of the people interviewing Marianne van Loon, but we should not let these people have free space to spread uh, untruths to our student population. So. That's one of the things uh, you can see on the slide. Another one is, of course, uh, the occupation of the academic club uh, at the University of Amsterdam, which was forcefully evicted by the uh, board uh, of the university. Um, a quick note about this uh, campaign, the Fossil uh, Occupy campaign. It's a worldwide campaign where several, uh, in several places throughout the world, students occupy uh, their institutions to demand uh, to decarbonize, democratize, and decolonize. Uh, why? Well, because that are three very important uh, <laughs> things. Um, next slide. So this is just some of the, by exposing the problem, you become the problem, because often when these people speak out, uh, the response is, you damage the credibility of the university, we will send riot police to you, this is very bad, think of our reputation. So, the other thing I wanted to spend some time on is academic freedom and objectivity and the idea that you can or should say anything, because I think the past months we've seen uh, the danger of wokeism uh, being discussed a lot in the Dutch media news. Uh, so, can you still say that uh, non-binary people uh, should not exist? Uh, is our academic freedom in danger? Uh, so that has gotten a lot of attention, whereas on the other hand, uh, the academic article peer reviewed, published by Suzanne Tauber, that led to her uh, eventual uh, disturbed working relation, uh, did not get that much attention from the same people who cried academic freedom is really important. And for me, that shows something, namely that this academic freedom is uh, brought out when things threaten status quo, because in the status quo, uh, non-binary people or all the wokest things are still not as much status quo as we would want. And pointing out that people deserve a seat at the table or deserve uh, to lead a dignified life, still seen as threatening, Whereas um, things that are not seen as threatening, so saying like, well, maybe it's not a problem to uh, say slurs to non-binary people uh, is uh, defended with uh, academic freedom. So the main point I wanted to make that I walk into as an academic is 
that I find a danger or I, f I find it difficult to speak out about the things that threaten status quo because that's what I've sort of seen throughout the last years. If you speak out about things that do not fit the standard story and that threaten vested interests, people are less willing to defend your story than if what you say is uh, very much fitting within uh, both the lobbyists, the sponsors, the funding, and the general narrative. So that was my story. And then I pass it on. Do I pass it on? Yes. Yeah, then I pass it on to Marta. <laughs> Thank you. This works. Awesome. So, yeah, uh, as Garrett already introduced me, I'm a um, drought risk scientist and I basically work from nine to five at the view on climate adaptation. But every other minute of the day, I try to advocate for climate mitigation because I've seen the dangers through my work, the limits to adaptations, the limits to what people can adapt to and the dangers that are faced when we do not mitigate that risk. And so given that we have, oh, I think the slides didn't, well, the words are removed from the slides, but okay. Anyway, <laughs> so I think, well, given that we are uh, having only a limited window of opportunity that is rapidly closing, I think, you know, I believe it's absurd that we as scientists um, just keep trying the same and same all over again and do not speak up because we've seen that this just producing more facts does not get, give us the same reaction or the reaction that we would expect. And so I think we should raise our voices more. We, sh we should speak up and we should act more. And uh, let me explain a bit about that. Because uh, personally, I work on water security situations in Europe, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I've seen the dangers of water scarcity leading to people trapped in poverty. There is a drought, people lose their income, they lose their wealth and they are not, uh, they face extra barriers to adapt to the upcoming drought, meaning they're trapped. And that happens already under 1.1 1 1 degree. And we know that climate change will even worsen this situation. And what we're seeing now in Sub-Saharan Africa, especially in the Horn of Africa, is that the ongoing drought is way worse, even than all my models, all my research that I did. I couldn't predict this situation. And that's scary. And what's also scary is that this something similar is happening to the IPCC reports. Every time there is a new cycle of IPCC, we see that we are closer to the danger, that we are closer to the tipping points, that we are closing closer to one and a half degree warming. And what is more is that we don't see the emergency response that we would expect based on these facts. If the IPCC report were to be a diagnosis by a doctor delivered to one of your loved ones, you would, you would cry or you would be super angry about it and you would internalize that knowledge. And then you would ask the doctor, okay, so what should I do? You would do everything to heal as fast as possible. And currently that's not what we see happening when the IPCC reports are brought out. And so that leads me to two conclusions. Either when policymakers, when decision makers read these reports or see these reports, they don't care or they see the facts, but they don't really hear them. They don't really understand them. And I choose to believe the second one because something uh, I've experienced myself, I have done a lot of uh, research about these drought, risk drought impacts and delivered reports to decision makers. Just presenting, for example, to Angola and, uh, or Botswana and policymakers, hey, uh, you know, in the future under climate change, half of your population will face a drought every single year. This was just one of the facts in one of my slides and I didn't get any response. And then I did more. I, I did more. I went to talk to them. I spoke up and I said like, why are you not reacting? Why are you not scared because of these results that I just presented? And they actually said, oh, I just thought it was another fact in your presentation. They didn't really felt the emotion that came with such a scary fact. Didn't really understand this was, they didn't even trust it because I wasn't really showing that I trusted these results by just having them on one other slide, on one other figure. And so the question is like, why do we as scientists expect a different reaction from the audience if we don't react on our own results, if we don't react based on the facts that we see? And so that leads me um, to 
I'm sorry, there were supposed to be some words in a quote, but it uh, got lost. But uh, that leads me to uh, examples that were already actually given uh, also by Gerrit, uh, the famous uh, NASA scientist uh, James Hansen, who first in the US uh, co uh, Congress warned the Congress about the dangers of climate, si of, of climate change, the dangers of global warming. And then after 20 years of inaction, he's, he became an activist. He went to protest the Keystone XL pipeline in front of the White House. And that's inspiring. I think um, that's also what I think we should be doing. And we can question, okay, so if we speak up, if we do more, would it actually, um, would we actually risk our credibility? But we can ask the question differently. How do we believe we still stay credible when we know these things and we don't act? Because credibility is based on neutrality. It's based on scientific integrity. And neutrality already touched upon. If in such a crisis as now, we don't speak up, that doesn't mean we stay neutral. It's the opposite. If we don't say anything, we acknowledge, we leg legitimize the status quo, which is a dangerous situation with avoidable harms. And as a climate scientist, I can say that our scientific integrity is constantly under risk. It's constantly threatened by a lot of false information that's out there. So we should speak up to keep this scientific integrity. And other scientists, we as sci climate scientists, we should, of course, you know, uh, act according to our results. But also other scientists, they should act according to the science of others. Because if scientists already don't trust the results or don't show trust to other results, why are we even you know, hoping the public would do so? And so I personally think um, that in a current crisis where disasters, diseases, deaths are at our doorstep when human rights are violated, I think we should explore new forms of communication. We should write papers, we should write opinion pieces, we should sign petitions, we, we can do more. And I can do more and that's why I joined Scientists' Rebellion. I think we as scientists, if we join non-violent di non direct actions, we can strengthen the voice of the climate movement. We can add credibility to it. And then we can hopefully get the results or we can get this uh, climate action moving. Um, yeah, so to close, I really think we should, um, we should do more because we can also be disruptive. We know that if we don't act, climate, sh climate change will be even more disruptive. Thank you. And I'll give the word to Anna. We are living in a climate crisis. I cannot find the words that describe, that do justice to the direness of the situation that we are in. I can list the deaths, the suffering, the threats, but the numbers do not convey their meaning. Last year in, in October, the United Nations reported that currently the um, uh, governmental pledges to cut greenhouse gas emissions amount to 2.5 degrees warming. This condemns the world to global a catastrophic climate breakdown. It is clear what needs to happen. The solutions are not the problem. The problem is lack of governmental action, illustrated for example by the 340 billion fossil subsidies annually. And where does this leave us? What are our options and responsibilities as citizens and academics in the ecological and climate crisis? We can vote. We can change consumption behavior. Both are important, but I think insufficient, because not effective enough. Despite voting for a Green Party, our current, uh, the climate policies of our government are violating human rights, as noted in the uh, ruling of the Dutch Supreme Court on the Urgenda case. And over the past 10 years, citizens reduced their carbon footprint by 25%, while the 12 Dutch biggest emitters still pollute as much as they did 10 years ago. Governments are ignoring facts. The gap between climate science and policy is only increasing. And Peter Singer tells us that it's our obligation to do our best to pers persuade governments to find a solution. And so I see as a third option, next to voting and changing consumption behavior, that we need to raise the alarm. Scientific research shows that when, that when an individual signals a threat, but other people ignore that threat, they are much more likely to ignore it as well and suffer the consequences. 
our government is ignoring the threat. And so it is up to us, citizens and scientists, to raise the alarm instead. If we remain silent, the idea that everything is fine, that everything will work out, remains intact. And we need to break through this soft denial. And I think we can do this either collectively or individually. Individually, for instance, by writing opinion pieces and collectively through activism, such as uh, the road blo blockade that, you, that was on your slide. And of course, there is a risk that when you speak out that you harm your scientific integrity or your perceived scientific, scientific integrity. The worry is that you will ignore counter arguments. But um, climate science has been conservative and honestly, all the people, all the academics that I know who participate in climate activism want nothing more than, than to be proven, proven wrong. Objectivity is a procedural quality, and this is also why we allow corporate scientists. So if corporate scientists are allowed, why wouldn't surely uh, activist scientists should be too? And I think that it can even increase your credibility that you show that when you act on the facts, you show how seriously you take the science. And moreover, if scientists, journalists, and civil servants need to be remain need to remain quiet because of obje objectivity, who is who is there to speak up for us and who is going to save us? So raising the alarm, it has shown to be e effective. Historically, so many. Uh, important rights and also human rights uh, hinged uh, upon uh, activism. And also here in the Netherlands, the climate movement today has shown to be effective. For instance, the ban on private jets, the um, uh, ABP, our pension fund, phasing out of fossil fuels. Parliament is researching a citizen's assembly for climate policy. policy. And finally, after um, 10 years after the government uh, saying that it will end fossil subsidies, it's finally under pressure to really do so. So if an effective strategy is available, can inactivity still be considered neutral or is it merely the majority position? When does remaining silent become as political as speaking out? Despite the IEA and the IPCC saying that um, opening that more uh, oil and gas licenses are incompatible with a limiting warming to 1.5 degree, degrees. Our government is still planning to extract uh, gas from the Wadensee. Is that more radical? Is that more irrational than blocking a road? Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, doesn't think so. And so I'm not saying that activism is perfect. I think it is the best alternative we have. Because climate change is not a movie, it is your future. It is real, it's coming, and it's already here. There is still so much suffering that can be prevented by taking adequate action now. And if not you, who? If not now, when? So please choose science over silence. Thank you uh, for having me all here today. Uh, I'm really glad that I'm also getting the opportunity to contribute to this important topic of climate change. Because we are with the world in a climate emergency, and we must take action now. Or let me wait a second. Can I actually state this as a climate communication scientist? Can I state that we are in a climate emergency? Can I state that we must take action now? Shouldn't I also be referring to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in my speech? Uh, shouldn't I also highlight the uncertainties that are also present in climate science? These are all questions that many scientists, as we also see here today, are struggling with. To what extent can, uh, should I preserve my scientific credibility? Or to what extent should I also sound the alarm about dangerous climate change? This is a question that also triggers me a lot. So for example, when I was doing my PhD, uh, I was in a battle with reviewers. Uh, one reviewer said, you should really state that the IPCC is really clear, uh, but you cannot say anything more than that. While the other reviewer said, you should state that we are in a climate crisis and a collective action is needed. So what was I supposed to do? Uh, another decision that reflects this uh, battle that was also within me is that when I started my PhD, I removed from my LinkedIn page that I founded one uh, green political party in uh, the city that I was living in. That I also did that 
consciously probably, but not really to the extent that I was really thinking about why did I do that? So increasingly this question is a question that really triggers me and this is also a question that I want to do more research on since I'm a climate change communication researcher. And my point is here today is not that we should ask the question, can scientists be climate activists? No, the question should be, in which parts of scientists' science communication can they also allow for political values, moral values, ethical values? And I'm specifically referring to these three parts of values because this is also part of the value-free ideal of science. Already since uh, World War II, there was this notion that we should, be, should have value-free communication. Um, so value-free communication means that scientists in their work but also in their communication towards the public, there should be no space for uh, moral, ethical and political values. Well, I think that many of us already agree, or many scientists, that there is no such thing, or it's not even desirable or possible, uh, that there's pure value-free science. However, there are, as we can also hear today, debates about whether it is uh, desirable that we have uh, to a large extent also room for political and ethical and moral values in scientist communication. Because not only because uh, can, does it actually move people to action, but also the question, does it hurt indeed scientist authority? Because the risks that are not highlighted here today yet is that if you really hurt scientist credibility or scientist authority, the risk is that scientists is just treated as just another opinion. And when science is treated as just another opinion, well, then why even bother about acting upon climate change, right? So I state that we need actually more research on, um, uh, that we need more research on in which parts of scientist communication can, is there also room for human values? To be honest, I often have the feeling that there's not much research underpinning the uh, conversation that we're having about this topic. Well, it's a really important topic. And um, the topic is also much more complex than just a question, yes or no. So what I feel is that, oh. so for example, we should also look at the actions that people are taking. So when we're talking, for example, about Peter Kalmus, who was uh, participating in civil disobedience, getting arrested, how does that also uh, compare to, for example, to the open letter that many climate scientists in the Netherlands uh, sent to stop the gas drillings in the North Sea. Does that matter, civil disobedience versus an open letter? Does it also matter, for example, what kind of language we use? To what extent should there be room for value judgments? Can one argue that climate change is most important, for example, more a political statement? Uh, as other people of the general public, for example, have other convictions about what are the most important topics in the world? Or what kind of language do we use with regards to policy? Here it says, for example, forbid pri uh, ban private jets. Um, can scientists be policy prescriptive and state specifically what needs to happen? Well, there is some limited research available already on that that shows that indeed uh, climate scientists, their credibility is not hurt if they advocate for certain climate policies, except when they advocate for nuclear energy. So, interesting. And last but not least, we should also know, have much more research on to what extent can scientists also be human beings, authentic, and show their emotions, as scientists are very frustrated. And uh, also what we saw with Peter Kalmus, who was very um, distressed and sad in his speech. But what kind of effect does that have? Does that move people to action? Uh, what does that do to science authority? I believe that these are all questions that we should think about. Uh, so to state my point again, it's not about whether scientists can be climate activists, it's about in which parts of their communication can they also provide room for their human values. Thank you. Okay, uh, last one on the panel. I'm a philosopher, uh, but uh, that's irrelevant to whether you should believe anything I say. Um, now, I have uh, three arguments, and uh, I'll try to keep them to time, so I'll really just outline them. Uh, one is that I'm bringing worries here, basically, um, bringing open questions. Um, but I think the questions that should be asked about the idea of academic activism. The first is whether academic activism is bad for democracy, uh, whether it is anti-democratic in its character and has other kind of implications. 
Um, the second is whether it is bad for science, and that's something that we already saw some people touching on. I'll try not to repeat that when I outline my, uh, my version. And the third one is that it may also be bad uh, for activism. Um, so, uh, just to explain a little bit, so I'm interested here in the idea of academics using our status opposition. I'm a professor of X, uh, therefore, I should be able to speak at a special place. I should be given more uh, influence, more of a position, more of a hearing. Therefore, I should be in charge of whatever. Uh, therefore, so I'm using my position, yeah? But also, uh, the idea of activism, uh, I think, is the idea that uh, success is to achieve a certain political outcome, not merely to contribute to a democratic political process. So I think these are two things that I associate with uh, the idea of academic activism. So you're using your academic position, not just your citizenship, yeah, uh, and you're um, trying to influence outcomes, not merely contribute to the process. So then, first arguments. Um, the idea that academic activism may be bad for democracy, at least in the sense that it is anti-democratic in its character. So for this, uh, I require to give a kind of sketch of a division of labor I think we all take something like this for granted when we think of democracy. We have uh, some people, uh, sorry, the people should be in charge. The people's opinions should ultimately decide uh, uh, who is in power and what kind of policies get made. Uh, of course, there's a problem with the people because most people don't know very much about very many things. And therefore, we have this wonderful device, a division of labor, where some people go off and study really hard sp specific things and then come and can present their findings to inform our general discussion. Nevertheless, in that division of labor, there are some people who are investigators, and there are some people, uh, uh, they are experts on, on what the facts are, but they are not the ones who get to make the decision. The decisions get made on the basis of uh, what people feel about those, based on their values, and also considering other things that are important. Uh, because one of the things about experts is they're uh, not only very knowledgeable about one particular area, but also very convinced that this is a very important area. That's why they spent their life on that. So if you think about energy security right now, thanks to Putin's war, that is a relevant, valuable thing for a democratic political process to be concerned with, as well as climate change. Um, and that's the kind of thing that's part of the division of labor. So what goes wrong? Uh, well, um, if, if academics think of themselves not as contributing to this conversation, but as having some kind of right to determine the outcome, then they are not uh, following that division of labor anymore. But also we should uh, say, well, they have no leg uh, legitimacy to make these decisions. There's nothing special at all about academics. I am one, I know many others. Some of them are nice, some of them are not nice, but none of us are in any way special people. We're not uh, smarter, uh, we're not morally better people. Uh, a few of us know a lot about very specific things, and if you want to find out about those things, go ask those ones. But not another one, yeah? If you want to know about uh, 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 the geophysics of climate change, go ask a specific uh, 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 scientist who works on that area. Don't ask uh, an economist. Then, yeah. Um, so we have very specific expertise, and that's it, yeah? So we don't have any other special status. There's no other reason why you should listen to us. Uh, uh, at least no other reason why you should say, oh, he said it, therefore, uh, do it. Um, so, so that's the idea here. So we, we shouldn't, uh, we should keep this uh, distinction between investigation and, uh, and decision. That's so key for, for democracy. So let me go on to my second uh, uh, argument now. Let me outline this. Um, and this is that um, I think it's bad for science, or it may well be bad for science, um, for academic scientists or other academics um, to to take up this activist role of trying to directly influence political outcomes. Um, and this is for two main uh, sort of reasons. One is that I think there's a real risk uh, that I think that activism, being an activist, is a different uh, role than being a scientist, as being an investigator. An investigator tries to pursue the truth where it takes you, even if that is inconvenient. An activist already knows all the important answers, all the important truths, and now they are concerned with a different task, which is a political task of making the world act according to that. These are very different perspectives on the world. And I don't think you can be a very good scientist if you are 
already, uh, if you really are full of this identity as an activist. I don't see any more how you can be a disinterested pursuer of the truth wherever it takes you. I think that the political uh, uh, objectives um, will induce you to look in certain ways for certain things, to look for certain rationalizations, to dismiss certain evidence. This is the standard motivated reasoning. Yeah? Uh, we, we know it in all kinds of areas. If, you, if you're already convinced of the answer, you're not going to be very good at investigating what the answer is. So that's the first one. And the second one is something which has uh, already been mentioned, um, which is the, the perception that scientists, um, from outside, that scientists are not anymore to be trusted. So this is also a way in which I think that it's not just about a few academics saying, I feel my conscience is I should be an activist. The point here is a few academics doing this, more than a handful at least, can can undermine the entire idea of having academic science as somehow objective, somehow capable of operating outside politics, of generating inconvenient truths that we should pay attention to. Because if, if we start to see, oh, it's, it's political activists, oh, it's just politics all the way down, then the entire uh, idea of having a politics-free zone for the investigation of, uh, of truths uh, sort of disappears. And then anything that any scientist tries to say about anything which is inconvenient for some group, they'll say, ah, it's just politics. It's just power. Um, so these are the two sort of reasons why I worry that it could be bad for science. And the final thing I want to say is that I also kind of worry about what academics will do to activism. Um, because like I said, academics are not special people in any way. Um, we're just very good at one particularly, usually very boring thing. Um, and we deserve respect for that and for nothing else. And so I'm kind of, I kind of worry because um, if, because of our uh, 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 ex, uh, uh, academic status, our epistemic privilege in a democracy, because of our special role in the division of labor, we get taken so much more seriously. And that means that we can also, without really thinking about it, come to dominate activist uh, groups and organizations um, so that we can, uh, uh, even though far more competent people, far more representative people may exist who could lead such organizations, we put ourselves forward. Uh, we tend to be very good at uh, verbal arguments as well. Um, and that can mean that, uh, yeah, so we take over, we push other people aside. Um, uh, that our priorities, our issues, uh, our weird obsession with Shell, uh, frankly, uh, so many academic activists talk about Shell. No one else seems to care about Shell. Anyway, um, <laughs> which, which issues, which, which things become the priorities of activist movements start to come uh, uh, out of this kind of self-selected group, self-selected for their passion, but not for any kind of political competence or legitimacy. And I also worry about that. So that's, those are my concerns, challenges, uh, bad for democracy, uh, bad for science, and maybe even bad for uh, activism itself. Thanks, uh, thanks very much uh, to all of our panelists. We'll start with, uh, with one or two uh, questions here on the stage, and then we'll move to, to the audience. So please start thinking about your questions, and I, I would encourage you to, to try and pose succinct questions. And you can ask a question of a specific uh, person on stage, uh, or you can pose it as a general question to the panel and we'll see who picks it up. We'll sort of try and work in an organic manner. Okay, I want to pick up on something uh, that Tom said about uh, the dangers of, of activists or academics acting as activists leading to academics losing their credibility. And I want to ask a question to Christelle about what do we actually know? What has the research shown, the limited research that there is? What do we know about some of these dangers? We actually do not know a lot. So we know a little bit, there are one or two or three studies about um, what kind of language, like can they advocate explicitly for certain climate policies? Well, not for nuclear energy, but for the others, it does not hurt scientists' credibility. But we, know, we don't know a lot, for example, about what the roles of scientists in civil disobedience, while well, you increasingly see that. Uh, we, often these scientists are referring to studies where they say civil disobedience has a positive impact on society, people are taking climate action. Well, we actually do not know if that also counts for scientists, since scientists, in my opinion, do have a different role in society than, uh, for example, NGOs or the public. So 
I think we need much more research on that. Um, also in particular, that I forgot to say in my speech is that um, scientists now also wear their academic lab coats. They use academic symbols also to participate in these kinds of protests. And what is the effect of that actually? And is that also, is the public also expecting that from uh, scientists? Is that, do they justify that? So um, we need much more research, <laughs> yeah. Thanks very much. I have a question for Marta next. Um, do you think there's something unique about the climate crisis that makes it a legitimate subject for activists to engage or for academics to engage as activists on? Or is it just something that you particularly are passionate about, particularly worried about? Yeah, thanks for the question. I'm definitely worried about it. Uh, that is definitely true. I think there is a few uh, special things about the climate crisis. It's, it's, a, it's a special crisis in the sense that there is uh, people that have had a lot of contribution to the causes and other people that maybe face the consequences. We have, um, it's a global, uh, yeah, it's a global issue that can also only be solved on a global scale. I think there is also one thing that, um, and it kind of uh, is also an answer to, to what Tom said before. I think when you said, yeah, you know, scientists uh, know a, a lot about a very tiny thing. And I think that's the beauty about the IPCC reports that combine lots and lots of science, science scientists that conveys a consensus message and having such a strong consensus about with so many people saying, hey, this is a huge crisis, something we've never seen before. It's a threat. I think in that case, that makes it special because that is something that we, ba we barely ever saw before to have such a six cycles of huge reports um, with consensus of so many scientists saying we're in danger. We should do something. And we have only limited time to do so. And I think that makes it, I think also the urgency, the speed of it um, is also especially, um, well, I would say special. Like, um, I fully agree we need more research. I like research. I think we definitely do need that research. But we're burning to 1% of our carbon budget every single month. And so, yes, we can do the research. We should do the research. But should we really wait till we can be 100% certain it works? Or should we just try it? Because I think it was said before, you know, it's the best we got maybe at this point. Follow over here. I think as a scientist or as a person, if you see preventable harm happening and you can prevent it in some way, you have a res responsibility to do something about that. Whether you're a person, an academic, a student, if you can see it happening and prevent it from happening, you should try. And what makes climate breakdown, I think, uh, special is that it is so very clear that it's happening about a lot of preventable harms. You can say it's dubious, we're not sure, we don't really know what's going on, but with climate change, you cannot make that case. There is preventable harm. I just wanna, before we open the discussion, say something about your definition of activism. Um, because uh, it's not necessarily an empirical definition in the sense that, for instance, uh, XR has three demands. They are tell the truth, do what's necessary, and um, uh, yeah, what's the verb? A citizen's assembly for climate change, verb. Um, and, and the citizen's assembly is um, a direct democracy tool that, for instance, was used in Ireland uh, to legalize abortion. And so I think that uh, it's not necessarily the case that activists always have a political outcome. Uh, and for NXR, it's very clearly the case that it's not about a political uh, outcome, but it's about uh, helping a democratic process. And it's also not clear that activists already has, have the answers, because the answers must come from the democratic um, citizens' assembly. And I thought, you know, to like challenge your definition before we open the discussion about activism was a... Nice thing to do. I, I, and you said something about academics being taken seriously, and I, I don't think that many climate scientists feel taken seriously, but... Okay, uh, Tom, I've got a question for you. You're quite skeptical about the role of uh, academics uh, engaging in activism. What do you think the role of academic institutions should be when it comes to activist activities by staff? 
Should they try and remain as neutral as possible? Or are there cases where perhaps they should impose sanctions on those who bring the name of the university into disrepute? Okay, could get me into trouble. Um, <laughs> let's see, uh, universities are mostly monstrous uh, corporate organizations who we should not respect any more than Shell. On the other hand, I respect Shell a lot more than <laughs> some people on this panel do. Um, so I have no particular interest or care in the, in the, the university's obsession with their reputation and their status rankings. However, I don't like being surrounded in a society or in an institution by people who think that by shouting really loudly about what they care about the most, that they get to decide what happens, that they get to decide, for example, what companies can go to a careers fair. They get to decide on behalf of the whole university, on all the students, who we are and who we get to do. That's the kind of thing that I find frustrating. Yeah? The, the, the loud people always seem to be in charge. And they say, oh, no, we never get to speak. It feels like I never stop hearing these loud people. And I don't, it's always the same people because they're such a tiny number of people. And they claim to represent all the people and all truth. And I don't think they do. So I don't care about universities' reputations, but I do think that they should try to protect us from uh, the rule of the loud people. Wonderful. Yeah, and I was also wondering, because we say that the science is clear, which, of course, on many parts, is climate change happening? Is it caused by human beings? Is it dangerous? All these things are very clear in science, I, say, I think. But are we also very clear on what is the right pathway to take uh, if we're talking about climate solutions? What are, for example, what should be the energy mix? What should be, uh, so for example, nuclear energy? There are different stances on whether that's a good way to move forward. And can you, as a climate activist, for example, advocate then for certain climate policies? Um, I was wondering, because you said also the science is very clear, but what about the facets also where science is not so really clear about what the best pathway to take is? Do you also feel that you can, as a scientist, advocate for certain climate policies then? Uh, thank you. Um, I think the solutions are also clear. The latest IPCC, IPCC report has a huge table. This is very beautiful, showing the costs and the increasing costs of a whole bunch of solutions. So also there, there is quite a lot of consensus of what, which could be solutions that can actually help us. And if you can see, um, based on these, these suggestions, institutions like the International Energy Agency then makes models. Okay, so if we have this energy mix, we can be under one and a half degree. If we have this kind of energy mix, we can also have it. And this energy mix also works. If we have this energy mix, no, we cannot if we want to stay under one and a half degree. And then, up to then, then it's up to the citizens to decide, okay, which one of those uh, pathways that are all staying under one and a half degree because we don't want to cause harm we can avoid, then that, that last part, yes, let's have citizens decide. Yeah. Okay, let's open the, 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 the <coughs> questions from the floor. Yes, we've got a hand here already. Yeah. Uh, just tell us briefly, just what's your name and who do you want to ask the question to? Thanks. Um, my name is Sjurs Banker. I want to ask to anyone who would like to respond. Um, I wonder if you want to continue a career in academics, um, how do you weigh to become active as an activist for XR or uh, elsewhere uh, to the possibility to become politically act uh, active? Okay, so how do you balance those two? Yeah. Who wants to answer? Um, yes, sir. I, I just became an assistant professor, and so my career for being a full professor is more than 10 years away. But we have only nine years to actually do something about climate change. So for me, the priority now is to make sure that we have a future where I can be maybe a full professor. <laughs> were, you, were you becoming an activist on the side or becoming politically active? I think he's asking whether you should fully commit to activism versus fully committing to academia. No? no. no? Or activism or politics. My question was, if you continue to be an academic and you want to do something at the side because too little happens, then um, how do you balance the, the importance to become an XR or other activist to becoming uh, active within a political party? Yeah. or founding one? Yeah, I, I think it's a personal choice, and I think both carry risks. I, I know of scientists that actually 
still fo uh, it still followed that they at one point were part of a party that now is not very scientifically um, you know, following science. So both, both carry uh, similar risks. So I think in this case, it can be a personal choice. That would be my answer. Um, I, there is a, a sticker from the Humbach occupation that says climate breakdown doesn't wait till you have finished your diploma. And every time I see that, I really feel it. So I think that uh, when my PhD is finished, <laughs> I will dedicate my time differently. But then, again, we are in a system where you have to pay rent, uh, which I'm willing to do, <laughs> where you have to pay for your food, which I'm willing to do, where everything costs money. So it's also, I think, a question of how do you balance having a life and sustaining that and also having different moral demands, right? Because, of course, I, f I feel that prevent preventing preventable harm is a moral task. But then I also have family, I also have friends. There are also different things in the world that I consider to be ethical obligations that bind me in some way. So I have the same boring answer. It's a personal uh, dilemma. Okay, uh, question, let's go over here. Yeah? yeah. Sure, uh, Kun Lemaire. Um, I have a question for uh, Tom, and my question is basically to respond to the question or to the point raised by Anna about um, the definition of activism, and maybe I will slightly rephrase Anna's point, but it's exactly the same point. And the rephrasing is, um, suppose that academics don't advocate for a particular policy, but they just raise the alarm. So they just say, hey, listen, we need to do more, and what we need to do, that's up to the, to the citizenship. Would you then uh, concede your point that um, activism is non-democratic? Okay, so if, if you're limiting yourself to uh, acts of persuasion, um, then sure. But what I'm concerned with is firstly the use of your academic position as, uh, as a status to get an outsized place in the conversation, um, as if your uh, uh, status is relevant. Yeah? Um, and given that most, even on this panel, most of us are not remotely uh, relevant expertise on climate science. Um, I find this uh, a problem. <laughs> and, the, uh, and the second thing is uh, whether you are uh, limiting yourself to persuasion or really trying to take something more like coercive action, uh, such as so blocking a road seems to me to be relating to the democratic society, your fellow citizens and your government in a different way than publishing an op-ed saying, hey, the IPCC report, why aren't we paying enough attention to it and so on. Um, sure, but... So so your point it's is... It's democratic to say, hey, this seems a really important fact. It's not so democratic to try to coerce a government by inflicting yes, economic but, but, costs. Yes, but in some sense, scientists do have a respected position in society, and maybe if they raise the alarm, it will ring louder. And that could be a useful uh, thing, given our current predicament. Uh, yeah, I'm in favour. I, 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 of course, there's a, there is a climate crisis. I, I think that we shouldn't just confuse the fact that there is a huge problem with some kind of automatic idea of what uh, people should do, specifically the issue of do academics have a special responsibility, what should that responsibility be, what should its limits be, etc. Uh, thanks Tom, we've got a follow-up here from someone who is an expert on the climate science. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but I, I'm, I'm not going to address that because, well, I, what I want to address is that first you say, and I'm wondering what your take on that is, first you say, um, you know, um, we're not special as scientists, we shouldn't be presumptuous about it. But then your second point was, well, we shouldn't join a climate movement because then we're going to overtake it, which kind of means that we are somehow special because we would have that force so or that strength or whatever. So I'm wondering, um, yeah, how do you balance both? Quickly, it's the same thing that happens when you have these gap year students from rich uh, countries that go to like Africa to build houses or teach. And there's this weird idea that because they come so that they take their authority, their sense of entitlement with them to this other space and think that they're doing good and they're not. That's my concern, yeah? That just because you're good at one thing or whatever in a context doesn't mean that you should be leading a movement. I mean, is a sci is, yeah, if a scientist joins uh, an action group, there's no need to lead. And I, yeah, I don't see, I think that's more a personal trait to be wanting to, to lead, to be leading. 
Uh, clearly a contentious topic. I, there was a hand at the back that I wanted to go to next. Yes. Right at the Yes. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, thank you for the opinions and discussion. I'm wondering if it is so necessary to look at us as scientists and people as a merged unity. You've done something wonderful in your speech, and I don't know if you did sarcastically, but you said, I'm speaking here in my authority as a person, not in my authority as a scientist. And for me, that's always how I've been able to kind of bridge that conflict, where I said, as a scientist, I care of I care about scientific information, and my personal opinion as a person is that and that. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking that we have self-complexity in the sense that one is a profession and a role, and the other one is what we do as a person. And I think it's kind of related to someone who's saying he's wearing a lab coat. For me, that is where the challenge comes in, right? It's like I think there is a need to distinguish what we do as scientists and what we then decide to do as people. And for me, there's space for both, and it allows less of a rigidity in having to confirm to the moral norms, because you can always say that this is where the line starts. Now, in perception, I agree with you. We don't know if that actually works, right? That would be something that we need to better understand. But that's how I've been trying to bridge that conflict. And I'm just curious if you've done it. I don't know if it was actually done as a strategy or um, as a way to, to kind of challenge that assumption. So I'm just curious about your thoughts. Yeah, for me, I, I believe that as a scientist or academic, the very least you can do within your capacity as a scientist or academic is make sure that the institutions you're part of, that you challenge them to not participate in something that is wrong. So uh, all the examples I gave about the academic club and about Marianne van Loon speaking at events at the UFA are for me things you do because, because you're part of that institution, make you a special person to protest what is going on in that institution. So for me, in that capacity, as a scientist, you have a responsibility for what happens in your institution. Then I think as a person, you have a responsibility for what happens with our planet. So as a scientist, as a person, you can join Extinction Rebellion or many other groups. and I also think um, with great power comes great responsibility, right? If you, maybe scientists are not special in that they, they just accidentally got this position uh, and they are considered to be smarter or more legitimate or whatever, and we know that's not true. But I think if you're very rich and you can contribute to tackling climate breakdown, you should. I think if you have very strong arms, you should uh, take plastic out of the sea. If you have some special capacity or some privilege in some ways that makes you better suitable to do things, you should use that. So I think here Tom and I very much uh, <laughs> differ. But I, I think, yeah, scientists maybe have uh, a, a special way to like somewhat more uh, something that contributes to activism and they should use it because everybody should use what they have in activism because we are in a climate emergency. Okay. Oh, did you want to follow up? Yes. Yes, thank you. So can I ask you a question? Do you also feel like then that each action is justified? So for example, wearing a lab coat on behalf of all scientists, I'm not saying that I have a strong opinion on this, but or also each protest, each form of protest is also justified on behalf of academics' voice? Or do you feel since yeah, maybe that's just... Um, so you ask is, like, I would not want to... I would want to make a balance between um, my colleagues and their uh, positions and the cause I represent. So I would not blow up a pipeline in a lab coat. <laughs> Because I would think <laughs> that would be, I think that would be bad for the credibility of scientists. So I would not do that. I would also think that's bad for the credibility of the climate movement. <laughs> so that's also a good reason not to do it. So, but but I think I I don't feel that obligation, especially towards other academics. I feel that towards everyone. Does that make sense? No. 
I follow your reasoning. So I was wondering where precisely do you draw the line? So civil disobedience, is that a yes or no? Or, and why is that? And, um, um, and you don't differentiate between being yourself or, or yeah, yourself or as an academic, but don't you feel also then if you, for example, what if you draw the boundary here, whereas others draw, draw the boundary here, that you also actually uh, represent science that you have a responsibility also, to, also if you wear a lab coat to represent science more as a whole, while perhaps not every scientist agrees that each action is effective. Um, well, I'm also less of the lab coat wearing uh, activist, um, but I do also sometimes join Scientist Rebellion. Um, I think there's... So I'm, I'm sort of going to move around your question. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> Maybe I should join politics. Um, I think there's this question for, like, is there a hard line somewhere, right? Like, if, if this happens, then what about that? Where do you draw the line? And I find that a sort of, um, I find that the wrong question, because that I, I think there are things that are clearly permissible and clearly impermissible. And we, for me at least, and I don't think we necessarily have to do this game where it's like at one at what point does this guy become bald? You know this philosophical thing like one hair less, one hair more, uh, or when does a heap of sand become a heap of sand? Um, I, I I feel that blowing up something is clearly wrong at this stage, still for me as a person in this position. Um, blocking a road. I think is still very much permissible, also wearing a lab coat. And what's in between, because we're not in the gray zone yet, I don't feel like you can dismiss blocking a road or protesting to get uh, uh, pension funding differently or something like that. I, I don't think we can dismiss those because we haven't clearly defined the line of what, what would go too far. Okay, we had a question over here. Yes. Thank you very much. I was wondering, uh, so there is one dimension, um, or at least one forum, that hasn't been addressed in this discussion, and I would like to know what you think. So we've been discussing, you've been discussing uh, about uh, the potential impact that research researchers and scientists may have in tackling climate issues. Uh, but there is another dimension of the uh, academic job of academia in general, which is the teaching as well, right? So we also have a role as teachers, and, uh, and that is a forum where our voice is heard very strongly, because those who, are heard, who, who hear us and listen to us have taken the game, right? So I, I, was, uh, I was wondering um, your th what your thoughts are uh, on whether, uh, whatever opinion you may have about the relationship between academia and uh, activism, how is that qualified, if it is at all, uh, when what we're talking about is uh, not activism, say, in civil society, but in the classroom, whether would you put some limits to that, or, or, or in general, would you would you qualify your 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 thoughts on these matters, uh, thinking not as researchers but as, as as professors, teachers? Interesting question. Who wants to take that? Yeah. I can take it. Yeah, I th I think it would be super interesting, and it would also be needed that we have a mandatory mandatory course on climate education on the eco side that is currently going on for all people at university or for all students because as teachers we have the responsibility to pre prepare our students the, the responsibility but also the privilege to prepare our students for the future and so we want to have uh, to give them the right tools to live in a future to make decisions in a in now and in the future. And so they should know the complexity of the situation. They should be aware of the drivers of the barriers or the, or the reasons for inactions currently to the climate crisis. And that's why I think, yes, uh, that can also be some, um, I wouldn't even call it a form of activism. I would call it like taking up our responsibility to prepare our students for the future. Thanks. Uh, Tom, you want to follow up quick? Just that I think that academics need to take uh, professional ethics much more seriously than we have done, and apart from research ethics and plagiarism, and one part of that is understanding how much power we have in the classroom so that we do not uh, abuse that power to, in, in the ways of indoctrinating or something, because it's easy to say, 
well, <laughs> we're telling them about climate uh, change and that's the right one, but what about all the other ones that uh, some academics may believe in as pet uh, subjects? We should take much more seriously this, this power dynamic that's going on and stop taking the fact that our students are so uh, passive and, uh, and laughing at our jokes because of the, the social structure that's set up for us being actually worth listening to on every one of these topics. To say that there are other things that people might believe in next to climate change is a form of clim climate denial. Okay. Um, we, had, we had a question here at the front. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Uh, so I have a question for Thomas Wills. Uh, first, I was a bit surprised by the idea that where the, the academics are the only ones to be obsessed with Shell. <laughs> but my question is not about this. Um, I want to go back to what you were saying about the division of labor, because I think this is a great idea. It would be amazing if, as scientists, we could just provide facts and that policymakers would act on these facts for the best interest of everyone. However, we're saying today that this is very clearly not working. The six IPCC reports uh, synthesis has just been uh, published. It was like, I mean, there was really no news about it. Um, if this had been working, we wouldn't have been, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be at the six IPCC report basically saying exactly the same thing, just in worse. So what is our responsibility then as scientists when we're saying that there is this huge crisis that is extremely consensual, this is not an, just an opinion, um, and that nothing is, is done about it, but also worse, um, because these facts are not being provided in a vacuum, right? We're not, we're not just providing facts and then policymakers can act on it. What do we do when we see that there are other entrenched interests that impact how these facts are received? And for instance, I'm sorry, going to bring this collective obsession again, uh, companies like Shell have been engaging, yeah, sorry, <laughs> have been engaging in this information since the 1970s, uh, doing dismissal science and also like dismissing scientists themselves. And this is not like, it, it, it is one of the reasons why we are here today. And today we're not facing as much full-on climate denial, but we're facing a lot of discourses of climate delay. And one example, for instance, will be politicians from European countries saying they're going to do everything they can to keep 1.5 degrees alive, and at the same time, allowing new fossil fuel permits in North Sea, the Vadense, but also like a lot of other places. So what is our responsibility as scientists when we see this? Do we, can we stay actually in our positions and continue providing facts, thinking that this division of labor ID should work when we see it very empirically not working? Well, I mean, that's democracy. You don't get to have your way. That's the whole point of it. You don't just say, how passionately do I care about this? Oh, therefore, the whole society should do this. That's the entire point of liberal democracy. So it, the idea that democracy is failing because it doesn't do what you would like or doesn't move as fast on those things as you would like is a strange one. And it shows what I was saying, that this is fundamentally an anti-democratic uh, uh, idea. Yeah? So m maybe we just don't care. Maybe most of us just don't care enough about this. Maybe we care about other things. So much the worse for us as a, as a society, as a world. But, uh, but not, <laughs> it's not to say that it's not democratic just because it's not the answer you would like. Um, and <laughs> And the, uh, yeah, anyway, I'll leave the shell thing. <laughs> well, I think the shell thing was the most important thing, the thing that she said about disinformation uh, spread. So it's not, this is not democracy, this is corporate capture. And I think... But this, this again is the classic thing of an activist, yeah? The activist mentality that I said is, a, is troublesome for, uh, for doing the academic role properly. Uh, which is that evidence of disagreement is immediately evidence of bias. Yeah? Anyone who disagrees with you is immediately, ah, on the other side, on the wrong side of history, yeah, climate denialist, etc. <laughs> and I find this is exactly the pernicious thing I was talking about when I said that uh, academic activism may well be bad uh, for science itself. Shell finance climate denial, that is, that is not, that is just a fact. So it's, and, and, and they don't, they, they try to um, create unclarity about climate change. And, and that is the problem. And, and that is what, uh, what's the problem for democracy. So that's nothing, has nothing to do with what you said about activists. What did you just say about activists being uh, that they don't want to listen to anybody else? No, it's not. It, the least corporates are not willing to listen to anybody else. 
Okay, uh, interesting and contentious one. We had a question from the middle here. Thanks so much. Um, hi, I had two points I want to make. My name is, uh, first, my name is Sanne van Oosten. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Amsterdam in political science. Um, I heard a lot going on uh, talking about power and who has power. Um, and there was also, um, Tom, I believe you were saying um, we should not let, you know, the rule of the loud, uh, the activists are loud. Uh, we shouldn't let them rule everyone. I also heard you talking about the power as a teacher in the classroom. But how would you compare that to the rule of the rich, the rule of companies, of corporations? I mean, I'd love to think I'm very powerful, but we're just like so tiny compared to this huge battery of PR and everything that comes from the fossil fuel industry, all the FTEs, you know, all working their asses off just to show, you know, that fossil fuel isn't that bad, that they're doing so much for green energy and we need them to, you know, ruin our world a little bit more. I was thinking how you compare those two things. Another thing I wanted to talk about um, is uh, uh, transparency, something I'm super passionate about, transparency in, uh, uh, in um, open science and transparency in science. Um, there's a lot of talk in these things about, you know, are we neutral as academics? Are we not, you know, throwing away our credibility? Well, we're not, because we're also doing something that we should be doing anyway. Um, we're showing how we come to our answers. You should see how long I spend on writing my appendix. I wish I didn't have to do it, but I have to do it to show every single way that I tried to research this from every single angle. It doesn't all fit in the paper, but it fits in the appendix. I also have supplementary materials thousands of lines of code in which I show what I'm doing. I also provide all my data. And this is what we're all doing in science to show that we're, you know, of course we're not neutral, we're humans, but we're showing how we came to our, uh, to our conclusions and that we did that in an honest and open way. So anyway, I was thinking how you think that plays a role in this. Sure, we'll go here and then to Tom to take the fire. Yeah, I think that the question about power is really interesting and really pertinent because when we hear um, so at the beginning I said when you expose the problem you become the problem right and if you are going against the stream and even though it seems as if there are a lot of people who are uh, climate activists uh, on stage or uh, who say I'm, I'm willing to take personal risks uh, in order to, to fight for what we believe and what the IPCC says is necessary. Even though that seems to be the status quo, uh, our opinion is not backed up by vested interests. Our opinion is not backed up by the millions of uh, euros that go to the fossil fuel subsidies. It's not backed up by the shell money. It's, it's not backed up in the same way. And it's also something that people do not like to hear. You know, the, the idea of climate breakdown is real. Uh, we have to change our ways. We have to challenge businesses and politicians. That's not something people like to hear. And somehow, when you say, yes, yes, all is fine, people can hear this repeatedly and do not hear it as a bug or as something that bothers them. Whereas when you say, no, not everything is fine, it is heard in a much more uh, unwelcome way because it is threatening... Uh, how things are going. Also, if you have a message that doesn't, that people don't want to hear, you might have to repeat it again and again. And I, I can imagine, Thomas, that uh, people like me are very annoying in saying, Shell funds research at university, this is wrong for academic freedom, this uh, takes away our credibility. But I think Shell funding research at university is a much bigger threat to scientific objectivity, the pursuit of truth, and all these things we've heard, than people who say, here's the IPCC report, 99.8% of scientists says we have to change our ways and that we have a big problem. But my opinion, opinion, which says Shell is a danger, is something that goes against how our university is financed, it goes against many vested interests, and it's an inconvenient truth. So when I say this again and again, or only once, it is perceived as very annoying, loud, 
Shrill, why does she have to continue to make that point again? Okay, um, so the evil rich are influencing democracy, not so much in the Netherlands really, but, uh, but what would be wrong? What is wrong with the rich influencing democracy? Well, it's that substantially they have a power uh, to get more attention and more influence for their views. Um, and that power is essentially arbitrary with respect to the value of those views. Uh, they just happen to be rich, and therefore they can support whatever views they happen to have. And that's what's dismaying about uh, uh, outsized uh, power for the rich, especially as we see in like, the American uh, political system. Now, my point about academics is that they are substantially arbitrary with respect to the values concerns. Um, so... Almost none of the people who, who are interested in academic activism are, in fact, climate scientists or really know anything. Uh, yeah, yeah, almost none, yeah? Um, uh, almost none of them actually know anything more than any, anyone else in the world about it. Anyone can read an IPCC report. Uh, so there is no special thing. But there is one thing about academics which is uh, uh, different from the regular population, though. They are far, far more to the left. They hate capitalism. Uh, almost, uh, 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 almost uh, uh, entirely. And so if I look at the kind of activism that comes out and this obsession with one little company, which is really irrelevant to even to, to, to fossil fuel extraction in the world, uh, uh, that farm, almost all the national companies like uh, the Norwegian one, Saudi one, etc., are way bigger, almost irrelevant to outcomes, but obsession. Why? Because this is the kind of thing that academics as a population are concerned with, which is the anti-capitalist point. And my, I, I'm, my point is not that it could never have anything valid to that critique. My point is the reason why that critique now gets so much of a share of activism about climate change is not because of the value of the critique, it's because academics overwhelmingly already enter with that belief that capitalism is terrible, part of the problem. And that's the kind of thing I'm talking about when I say uh, that... Uh, Climate change activism by academics may also be bad for climate change activism. Okay, we'll have a quick follow-up. Sorry, we'll have a quick follow-up, and then we'll have a final question. Yeah, very, very quick. Um, so the other arguments you use that academics are in say already biased because they're left and anti-capitalistic. What we can see, and we, we, we know that um, that engaging in activism hasn't been really researched well, but it has been researched. There is a lot of proof that if you work with Shell or with ExxonMobil, your results of your research will be different. That's proven. And that just supports Harriet's point. Thanks. Can I very quickly say something? So part of what I investigate in my last published paper, I investigate a right-wing response to climate breakdown, which is also why I find it important to uh, see left-wing or more politically neutral, so for a long time Extinction Rebellion said we are not political. Um, also things to say about that, but I think that climate activism will happen, that people will have a response to climate breakdown, it is inevitable. It is inevitable that people will block roads and it, is, it might also be inevitable that people will have more extreme responses. It is not only the left who cares about things like nature or who cares about sea level rise. It is maybe the left who cares about black and brown people already dying. Uh, might be. I'm not entirely sure, but in my paper where I write about eco-fascist responses, I take a right-wing response to climate uh, breakdown very serious, and I say, okay, not all climate change activists are uh, anti-capitalists, some of them have very different solutions uh, of mitigation and adaption, like uh, border control, uh, population control, etc. And I think that dimension is very important uh, to, to stress. Climate breakdown is happening and will continue to happen, and the response to that will also happen. It's just how do we, in, in what direction do we take that response? I'm going to cut you off here. Uh, for a final question, someone who hasn't spoken yet, if you have some burning question, let's hear it. Yeah, go for it. Hi, so I'm Victor. I'm a student at uh, the VU. And I had a question also along the lines of the democratic aspects of involving <laughs> academics uh, in this debate. 
and to sort of relax the question a little bit, because I think there's a lot of sort of different notions of what a democracy is and that division of labor that's supposed to happen there. Um, the one that we have now is very separated, of course, where one political class is sort of responsible for making all the decisions and um, whoever manages to influence them gets the benefit of doing that, right? Um, and I think one of you mentioned uh, citizen assemblies um, and I was wondering how you all as academics sort of feel as uh, towards the potential of those to be a more, let's say, democratic uh, and perhaps more effective uh, way of addressing all of the issues that climate scientists and also many citizens uh, experience and see, and also how you would see your role as academics in these new and alternative forms of democracy. Thanks very much. Great question. Who wants to start? Final round. Um, so is the question to talk a little bit about citizens' assembly? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, so I'm not an expert, but um, I think the most important reason for choosing a citizens' assembly is that, so it, like just to introduce, it is a um, random selection of a representative, a representative group of the society, and then they get informed by uh, anyone they want to invite, um, so raising from scientists to companies to whatever. And then they provide um, uh, advice to the government. And then, for instance, in France, there has been a citizen's assembly on the climate change. And what happened there is that the government up front said that they were going to implement at least such and such uh, uh, proposals, but then they kind of didn't. But what is very interesting is that the outcome of those um, uh, of, of the advice that they gave was much more adequate than what the government co comes up with. And I suspect, or what I've read, is that this is because uh, politicians need to be re-elected every four years or whatever is your cycle. Uh, and then a random citizen doesn't, have that in, doesn't need to take that into account. So it's much, more, it's much easier to... Um, yeah, to, um, to do what's necessary, so to say. Yeah, do you want to add something? And I think, yeah, I, I, and, and what keeps coming back to me is what you said about that it's frustrating, the loud voices. And I, and I find your point so beautiful, what you said about, because you're raising the problem, you become the problem, and but what I, what keeps coming back at me is I'm thinking about the people who are frustrated about lack of food, about lack of water, and then maybe a company like Shell getting banned for you know, being, taking such an unscientific position and also such an elitist position. Maybe you know, you know, having to endure those frustrating voices uh, which will lead to less frustrating drought and hunger and debt is, yeah, is, you know, a fair trade-off. Okay, on that sort of optimistic, sort of sad point, uh, <laughs> we will uh, end this evening's discussion. Please give our panelists a hand. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>